Um, yeah, so I'm not an urban economist, uh, but I've really enjoyed what I've learned today. Um, I focus on how the environment affects economic development, and this is a paper that, that was actually already published, so, so it's out there in circulation, uh, where we're sort of trying to understand whether or not shifts in the climate uh, actually influence the likelihood of various types of human conflict. And so what I'm going to show you is we're going to think about human conflict at all different scales of social organization, things from sort of individual personal level conflict to group level organized conflicts that go up to the scale of sort of the civil war. Okay? Uh, this is joint work I'll mention with Marshall Burke, who uh, for faculty and audience is on the job market this year, and uh, Ted Miguel, all three of us are now at, at Berkeley uh, for a brief interval. So classically, when we've thought about how the climate in affects society, we tend to think about the human impacts of climate or how the climate affects maybe a given crop, uh, maybe an individual's health, but it's something like the interaction between an individual and the environment. But as we are moving forward in research, we're starting to see that there's you know, interactions between individuals that themselves appear to be empirically related to what sort of external climatic forcing is going on, which suggests that sort of social dynamics, the internal dynamics of a society can be in certain ways sometimes modulated by uh, environmental changes. And we want to understand that because sometimes these social dynamics cause small amounts of external forcing to sort of... Uh, blow up and become a much larger, develop into much larger social impacts than might otherwise, uh, we might otherwise observe if we just focused on individuals' uh, sort of personal relationship to the climate, okay? Now, from a development standpoint, you know, why would you worry about conflict at all these different scales? War and inter interpersonal violence uh, obviously have dramatic impacts on, on human health around the world, as well as sort of enduring and widespread non-lethal impacts uh, affecting sort of, through both psychological and physical mechanisms, exposure to violence can affect you, uh, has been shown to affect individuals throughout their life. And then if you're strictly interested in sort of things like GDP growth, there's also uh, a fair amount of evidence that exposure to violent environments is, is detrimental for economies. So here is a, a paper by Sarah and Saxena from AER in 2008, and the gray bars are just showing when protracted civil wars occurred in various countries and we see that the GDP, growth, the GDP trajectory of countries sort of just falls off their trend, and obviously uh, the Civil War seems to be um, bad for economic development. So, so we're interested in conflict for a variety of different reasons. Uh, why might we think about the interaction between the climate and uh, human conflict? Well, there's a lot of hypotheses out there, and I'll be the first person to tell you that we don't actually know exactly what is going on behind the scenes. We're going to be able to examine here that there is going to be an empirical relationship between changes in the environment and outcomes that we observe, but we're not going to know exactly what it is that's linking these two things. There's uh, a large number of hypotheses out there. So just for example, one favorite hypothesis uh, that has been proposed by one of my co-authors uh, is that sort of local economic conditions play a really important role. So individuals who engage in conflict could are actually making a choice to engage in a certain type of conflict relative to some other type of action they could be taking. So they could be involved, for example, in a formal labor market, uh, but if the conditions in the formal labor market deteriorate, the appeal of working in maybe a violent labor market uh, might, be relatively, might, might rise uh, in relationship to the depression of the formal sector. Okay? So, for example, local economic conditions, labor market conditions are thought to affect um, people's willingness to engage in conflict. There's also an idea that's been out there proposed by many political scientists, which talks a lot about the capacity of the state to sort of import, enforce peace and stability within communities. And if the climate were to somehow alter it, so for example, if the climate affected economic output of a community, uh, the tax base would decline, and the strength of the state might decline along with it momentarily. So if we think about maybe an opposition group who's considering uh, making a push for power at some point, the optimal time to do that would be when the state is weak, right? So at that moment in time when state capacity has declined. There's also, I think you've probably seen it in newspapers, a lot of discussion about people arguing that food prices play a key role in instigating conflict. The empirical evidence on that fact is, is much weaker. Uh, there's also a lot of discussion that inequality can exacerbate the likelihood of different types of human conflict. And we actually see that in the data, or evidence that seems consistent with that in the data, uh, situations where climatic changes change the balance of income within a society, uh, then there seems to be different types of sort of redistributional conflict. Also, hypotheses out there about the logistics of violence. So various types of violence uh, 
for example, there's, there's studies on cattle raiding in uh, Eastern Africa, and in order to uh, raid someone's cattle, you have to sort of sneak up very close, and people have been studying, have, have proposed that in certain conditions it looks as though uh, having heavy rainfalls is great for growing a lot of foliage, and it's a lot easier to sneak up on your neighbor's cattle. Okay, so there's different arguments that, that things like that might be going on. Also, and this I think is related to what we'll see uh, in the next talk, there is a discussion that maybe uh, environmental changes induce rapid urbanization, okay, or large-scale migration, which can sort of concentrate populations in locations much faster than public resources can grow to, to handle those, uh, that influx of migrants, and that might lead to different types of conflict. And then finally, there's these sort of a psychological literature that I'll show you where we sort of have individuals that when placed in different environmental conditions appear to think differently, okay? They appear to respond to uh, other individuals in different ways, and there's a general tendency towards uh, to acting more violently under certain conditions that we're gonna think of, okay? Now, so, so that's one reason, there's lots of hypotheses to describe why these things might be linked. From a policy standpoint, we now have much better forecasts for both short and long-term climatic changes. So on an annual basis, we have uh, climate forecasts. And then we also have sort of the current discussion around the world is uh, uh, thinking about how much we should be spending to avert global climate change. And obviously an important fact is considering what the world might look like if we allow the climate to change, if we don't invest in those expenditures. So our question is to sort of say, well, we're gonna look at the quantitative literature and ask, is there evidence of a general linkage between any type of climatic changes and different forms of human conflict? And if so, what is the strength of that evidence? What is its nature? And what can we learn from it going forward? And so this is a, a, a different paper uh, than what I think we've seen here. What we're doing here is, is something between a meta-analysis and a literature review, where we've gone out there and actually engaged with researchers across a, a large number of communities. So here we list a few. For example, uh, we've collected papers from criminology, from archeology span and economics, human geography, paleoclimatology, political science, psychology. Okay, we've collected research work from over 190 authors around the world, spanning over uh, 26 journals, and you know, looking at conflict data sets from 45 different conflict data sets. In some cases, uh, the, data, the study, previous studies that were done did not meet sort of modern criteria for, uh, for causal inference using statistical techniques. And so we actually obtained and reanalyzed data, basically rerunning the study uh, for a large number of previous studies, contacting the authors, getting the original data sets. And then what we did to understand the extent of common, a common relationship observable throughout the literature, we actually take findings from many different studies and we convert them to this thing we call a standardized effect, where we try to measure what is the percentage change in whatever measure of human conflict we're looking at relative to a one standard deviation change in your climate variable. Now, the reason we use standard deviation changes in climate variables is because if you look at different locations around the world, the different variations in the climate that you observe look very different, okay? And so we want some sort of common metric uh, where we can compare the response of human societies to their local environmental conditions, given the fact that local environmental conditions are gonna vary in very different ways. So, Finally, we're going to aggregate results and try to ask, is there sort of one number or a set of numbers that, that we can take home as stylized facts describing the relationship between human conflict and climate variables? And we're going to do that using a Bayesian meta-analysis, which I'll show you at the very end, sort of to think about what are the take-home numbers. Uh, one really key part of this study is that we only wanted to include previous studies that use sort of rigorous empirical methods for causal inference. So we, wanted, we don't want to misidentify uh, the effect of many other factors that are not the climate and attribute their impact to the climate. So I think a, a useful example is to think about first the ideal experiment. What we would like to do is we would like to have two planets and we would heat one up and we would observe whether or not the rate of human conflict differed okay, between the treatment planet and the control planet. Now, now that's a difficult project to do. So instead of doing that, one might be tempted to look across populations and ask, are the populations that inhabit maybe warmer locations more or less violent than the populations that inhabit cooler locations? Uh, if we were to do that with different countries, for example, the United States and Mexico, we might observe that the hotter country has a higher rate of violence than the cooler country, the United States, but to attribute that all those differences to the climate would obviously be wrong, right? There are a huge number of reasons why 
Uh, Mexico is very different than the United States, very different geography, different political institutions, different income streams, uh, different colonial histories, okay? There's a huge number of reasons why they're different, and so we don't want to do that cross-sectional comparison because we just simply can't identify, we can't control for all these other confounding factors. Instead, what our approach is, is we do what we call a quasi-experiment, where we look for populations where they've been um, exposed to historical variations in the climate. So we take a population, we fix that population, we don't change who we're looking at, we follow them over time, as the climate changes, we act, ask whether or not they respond to those climatic changes with more or less conflict, okay? And by doing that, we know that all those factors we were talking about, the, hist the colonial history, the geography, the politics, those things aren't changing because we're looking at a single population. And that population effectively serves as the control group or the treatment group for itself at different moments in time, okay? So it's sort of like a difference in difference approach uh, for those of you who think that way. <laughs> All right, so, so we only looked at studies across all these different literatures that use this general technique, okay? And after doing that, we obtained 60 studies and breaking them down for you just by sort of where they're coming from so you have a sense of what we're looking at. Uh, 12 of the studies come from these sort of deep historical studies. These are archaeologists working in collaboration with paleoclimate uh, researchers in general. They're doing, and I'll show you what they look like so you have a sense of what those are. Um, then there's actually two studies that are true experiments where they put people in a room and change the temperature and see how they respond. Uh, and then the vast bulk of the studies are these observational longitudinal studies looking back retrospectively trying to deconvolve the effect of the climate uh, on different patterns of human conflict. And, and then we're looking across a variety of different types of human conflict like I, I told you before. So a large fraction of the studies are going to look at things like personal level violence. This can be things we're going to see studies on uh, domestic violence. Okay. Uh, then there's also group level violence, things like inter-ethnic riots, um, ethnic expulsions, overall political instability, uh, going up to sort of full-scale civil wars. And then finally, there's actually a, a fair number of studies that look at full-scale institutional breakdown. So in the modern world, we see very few examples of this, but when you look sort of historically, we, there's many very famous examples. So the collapse of historical civilizations are, are going to be a type of thing we can think of as like it's something like political instability. We don't always know the detailed story of what happened, but we observe that a population was traveling along and then at some moment in time something catastrophic happened uh, and the population, the, the political institutions as they had been previously observed effectively disintegrate. Okay. So that's going to be at sort of one end of the spectrum. Interpersonal violence is at the other end of the spectrum. The statistical framework that we use is, is not... Um, it's a standard difference and difference approach. We're going to look at populations. We're going to try to remove any sort of secular trend. Uh, the reason we do that, we don't look at trends in the climate, even though we think there are important trends in the climate, because we can't infer anything from them. Okay? There's too many things about society that change over time, and so we can't know whether or not long-term trends in violence are attributable to the climate or to changes in uh, law enforcement technology or economic development or political institutions change. Okay? So we're going to try and remove time-trending stuff, and then we're also going to try to remove all those time invariant factors, things like geography, uh, institutional history that I was talking about before. And so we do that in a statistical framework by regressing some sort of conflict outcome on things like temperature and precipitation, as well as location-specific dummy variables and linear trends. Okay? Now, or time specific, or actually this is a, uh, this could be a nonlinear trend using year dummies. Uh, and the, the way that trends are controlled for tends to vary depending on, on the study. Okay, but that's the general picture of what studies have to do to be included, and that's the approach we took in cases where we reanalyzed uh, other studies' papers. Okay? Now one thing that is not a, a good approach, but is often done in these studies, is that they should not include outcome variables on the right-hand side of this equation. So that's a, a well-known sort of, uh, but fairly common statistical error that's made. And basically, if you include things like income, over time or political institutions over time on the right-hand side, if we think that income is being affected by the climate and <coughs> might be affected by other things that are affected by the climate, putting them in the equation actually biases our estimates of the effect of temperature and precipitation as well. Okay? So in many cases when we reanalyze studies, we had to do it because we had to pull out the bad control variables that were originally included. Now importantly, I want to point out, like I said, we're only following populations over time. So this is going to be a model of when conflicts happen, it's not a model of where conflicts happen. Okay? We're going to say that the average level of conflict, which is going to be the, 
uh, the country or location fixed effect uh, is going to predict where co conflicts are going to happen, but we don't know what's driving that. Okay, so that may or may not be climate. And there's also a general trade-off that sort of is emerging in this literature, which is what we call sort of a frequency identification trade-off. So we're looking at shifts in the climate that have high frequency, okay? Annual variations, hourly variations. But what we really want to know is what the long-term trend of climate is going to do to societies, okay? Now the problem is, if you look at those trends, like we were saying before, human societies evolve very quickly. And so if there's a trend in the climate, many things will change and it's hard to attribute those low frequency variations uh, to be the proximate cause of sort of low frequency patterns of violence. So in general, we will see studies that look at low frequency variation, but we're gonna take them with a grain of salt. They're gonna be less, less well identified. We're gonna have less statistical confidence in their results uh, because there are many things about societies that might change, okay? So this is just a grain of salt for when we look at things that happen over century scales. So all I'm saying, it's a fancy way of saying that. Now, um, and now just one final point. I, I said we reanalyzed a lot of studies and, and now that the paper's out, uh, some people are unhappy about us having reanalyzed their studies. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> so <laughs> they, surprisingly, they're also unhappy. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so in general, we, we obtained data from a large number of studies and reanalyzed them to basically put them in that statistical framework I was just showing you. And sometimes it was to, to drop, to account for omitted variables that were not included, things like location fixed effects. Uh, and sometimes it was to drop variables that should not have been originally included, things like bad control variables. Um, and in some cases, the results got stronger. Uh, these two papers originally basically said the, the climate doesn't matter. Uh, there's an extremely strong climate signal in their data sets. Um, and then in other studies, including a study by my co-author, we, we've actually obtained results that, that were weaker than what was originally emphasized in the first study. Okay, so this reanalysis, reanalysis we think is quite important and it has brought into alignment a large number of studies that seem to give disparate findings, but when done in sort of a common statistical framework, produce things that in a much narrower, produce results that are in a much narrower band. Okay? Um, so that's, that's what we're doing. So just to give you a sense of... of so yeah. as well as sort of climate variables if we can, yeah. Okay. But yeah. Uh, so just to give you a sense, so these are the 60 studies. And we have pretty good coverage. We're pretty excited about this, result, this, this paper because we, we sort of can talk about different locations around the world. We find similar relationships everywhere we look. So here, each bar going across the graph is a different study. And the, the length of the bar indicates the sample of years in the study. Uh, and then the groupings indicate the region that was covered. And I'll point out that the x-axis here is a log scale uh, in time. So it goes all the way from 8,000 BC uh, up to the present day, okay? But the last 50 years are this, this part of the graph. <laughs> and, and so, you know, one thing you see, for example, is that the modern era, there's been a lot of study of Africa. Uh, but if we go back further in time, uh, and, but if we, want to, if we want to go back further in time, we sort of have to go to the Americas or the Eurasian continent uh, to get data there. But there are, there, is, there are modern studies from around the world in this sample, including a large number of studies that have fully global coverage, where sort of the sample of studies is something like all countries in the world. On the right here, we've plotted the same 60 studies, but we're now plotting them in sort of, in a space defined by the scale of their analysis. So on the y-axis is sort of the unit of analysis. Are they looking at things like uh, a municipality or a province scale up to like the region or global scale, okay? So this is sort of like what is their, what is the size of their outcome variable? And on the x-axis here, we have sort of the duration of the climatic variation that they're examining. So we have studies that go from an anomalous hour to the anomalous day, week, month, year, decade, and even a few studies that are sort of describing millennial, well, one study that's describing millennial scale variations, okay? So we sort of think we have really good temporal coverage, geographic coverage, and then in terms of spatial and temporal frequencies, uh, we're looking across a lot of, a lot of different uh, we're looking across all those different frequencies. Now, so I just want to walk you through a couple of the studies. I'm not going to show you all 60 of them, but just so you have a sense of what we're seeing in the data uh, across, across all these different fields. So this is a very famous study. So, so just thinking about sort of deeper historical studies first, uh, this was a, a very important study where they looked at the collapse of the Akkadian Empire, which was basically one of the first large empires. Uh, it was in Syria. And previously, people had not sort of known what triggered this abrupt collapse of, of an empire that seemed to be growing uh, very quickly. 
for hundreds of years. And, and what this team did is they went off the coast of Syria and they actually took a core. So they, they went down to the bottom of the ocean, pulled out a big tube full of mud, and they looked at the layers of mud. And what you can do is, is you can basically infer what is the rainfall level over land by looking at the mud just offshore. Because the winds always blow from the desert over to the ocean. And when it's drier over land, they pick up more dust and deposit in the ocean, which sinks to the bottom. So by pulling up this core, they're able to recover a record of rainfall in Syria. Okay? And when they do that, they plot out basically what is their inferred, uh, the inferred rainfall level in the region. And what they find is that the collapse of the Akkadian Empire, which is the sort of the time window is denoted by this orange band, seems to overlap with an abrupt drying event okay, over the Arabian Peninsula. Now, there, so that was sort of a, a, a seminal study. Since then, there have been many other studies at different locations around the world taking different approaches. So in some cases, they're taking tree rings. They're, they're taking cores out of trees and counting uh, the layers in the trees, trying to infer what is the temperature of Europe. Uh, in this study, they took a core out of a lake in southern China, and they're looking at how magnetized the layers are, trying to understand whether or not the monsoon was strong or weak uh, throughout historical China and tree cores in Cambodia, uh, and in this study, they, they took an ocean sediment sample from the Caribbean, and, and you know, different, in many different studies, we're finding very similar relationships. So for example, um, almost all Chinese dynasties appear to have collapsed during a, wet, during a dry interval, and no Chinese dynasty was able to consolidate political power after the collapse of the previous dynasty until the climate shifted back into its wet state. Okay. Now, interestingly, for example, the event here, which is the fall of the Tang Dynasty, seems to have been triggered by a drought, which was observable on both sides of the Pacific Ocean. Okay. So the drought that occurred in, in Tang Dynasty China also occurred in Mesoamerica and seems to be strongly associated with episodes of collapse in the Mayan Empire okay, on the other side of the ocean. So the Mayan Empire is really interesting. This is a case where the, the empire basically grew during a couple wet centuries. And then there was abrupt collapses of, of cities where the cities were abandoned okay, um, in, during, during three events. And we, don't, we know when they were abandoned because people have basically gone and read the text on these buildings. And there's like the last date on the text is when people stopped writing that there were people living in the city. So we know that the, the empire uh, collapsed in sort of these three intervals. And those three intervals tend to, uh, appear to overlap with three major drought events that occurred during sort of a century-long decline in rainfall throughout the region. Okay, so, so, so there's sort of a conspicuous, coincident timing of both the collapse of many different civilizations around the world with sort of large-scale climatic changes in these regions. Um, and, and one question we can ask is whether or not those, that finding has any relevance to the modern world. And one idea we've sort of pushed is that, no, it doesn't apply to everyone in the modern world and we need to take those findings with a grain of salt, but it is worth pointing out that there are many locations in the modern world that have sort of levels of economic development similar to some of these populations to, that were observed in the record. So if we were to go, for example, uh, to the collapse of the Mayan Empire, there are countries around the world today that are estimated to have sort of in purchasing power terms uh, per capita resources available to, to the population similar to what uh, Mexico had at, at the point of their collapse. Okay? Uh, there are, there's only a few, luckily there's only a few countries uh, in that sort of category, but there are a large number of countries that have GDP per capita similar to China at the time of the, the last dynasty collapsed, as well as to Europe during the medieval ice age, um, when there was sort of a high association between uh, violence and, and the climate. So we think that while these societies exist, the modern societies exist in a world where the technological frontier is very different to what historical societies experienced. Individuals within our modern society don't necessarily have the same, all, a uniform access to resources, and many of the individuals have resource, access to resources very similar to these historical populations. Now, shifting gears, we can think about some of these psychological studies that are really interesting. So, uh, uh, so one of the first, a really seminal study is a study done out in Arizona, where basically these researchers uh, Every weekend on the summer would go out and they, one of the researchers would sit in a car uh, at the exit of a parking lot where there's a stoplight. And they would wait until another car pulled up behind them and then they would proceed to sit. <laughs> uh, and the light would turn green 
and they would wait for the whole 12 second light cycle to go through and not go anywhere, okay? And the other experimenter was sitting in the bushes and would basically time for what fraction of the 12 second light cycle the second guy was laying on his horn, okay? And this was like, they were trying to measure whether or not aggressive behavior uh, ba basically changed as a function of temperature on the day that they were doing this. So they did this for every weekend throughout the summer in Arizona, and uh, this is what they obtained. All right? This is their result. They, they compute sort of a temperature humidity comfort index, and the time spent honking on the horn is on the y-axis, and, and as the temperature and humidity go up, uh, they observe, you know, people seem to be much more, act much more aggressively towards a complete random stranger in front of them. Okay. Um, now that seems sort of like a, a funny experiment. In, in a potentially more, more serious context, uh, some Dutch researchers actually took rookies who were being trained as police officers, and they put them in a training simulator where they were basically confronted with a video of an assailant approaching them with a crowbar. And they had to choose how to respond. Okay? It's a video, it's the same treatment, but they have two groups, and some of the police officers are doing this exercise in a, in a comfortable room, and some are doing it in a room that, that's hot. And what they found is that the researchers in the hot room were much more likely to take an aggressive stance towards the opponent, as well as to draw and fire their weapon. Okay? Basically, nothing else about the scenario is different, and they were debriefed afterward. They took a survey, and the researchers concluded that it appeared as though the police officers in the hot treatment felt more threatened than the officers that were in the cool treatment, even though they were obviously being confronted with the exact same visual stimulus. Okay? So something deep about how they're interpreting the actions of another individual is then changing their own reaction, okay? which leads to sort of an escalation of violence in this particular context. Now, there's the retrospective studies, which I told you were sort of the, the bulk of the, the research. Um, I'm just going to point out here some of the studies uh, sort of to give you a history of sort of where some of the literature has gone. So in a 2004 study by, by my co-author Ted Miguel and some of his co-authors, uh, they, they showed that civil conflicts in Africa, for example, seemed to, the, in, the onset of civil conflicts seemed to be highly correlated with adverse rainfall shocks. And they argued that it seemed to be, it might be due to the fact that GDP growth was declining at these times, okay? Sort of making this, this labor argument case that I, I told you about in the beginning. Now, Ted, as well as some of his co-authors, then did a follow-up study with my other co-author, Marshall, uh, where they revisited that data set, and they actually now included temperature, which might have been an omitted variable. So the days in which it's rainier also have a higher temperature or lower temperature, depending on where you are. And what they found is that temperature is actually a much more important explanatory variable. So having high temperatures seem to, seem to be associated with a higher risk of full-scale civil war in many of these countries. Um, and that, that gained a, a sort of a lot of notoriety. It was, it was discussed widely in the news. All right? But there's also studies, just for an example, that, uh, where, where people aren't even thinking about the climate. Okay? So this is a study uh, by, by some folks at, at Berkeley where they're basically trying to understand whether or not there's more domestic violence um, after football upsets. Okay? So when there's an, un an unanticipated upset in, in the Major League uh, Football, uh, there seems to be more, more domestic violence. And they were just including temperature as a control variable in their regression. But what they found is a really strong effect. And so this is a situation we sort of think that the researchers are definitely not biased in terms of reporting things. They didn't even care. They only mentioned this like sort of at the very end in, in passing. And we're like, oh, that's really interesting. It's actually their control variable is consistent with what everyone else is finding. Okay. Uh, and then sort of following up on these studies, in a 2011 paper that I did with some co-authors at Columbia, we were able to actually sort of blow, scale up previous studies, and we were, we were linking the global climate to global patterns of violence. Okay? And the way we did it was we sort of uh, studied the largest global pattern of variation over time known as the El Nino Southern Oscillation. I don't know if you've heard of that before, but I'll show you it if, if this button works. Um, just so you have a sense of... How do I click it? Oh, right here. Okay, so, um, so an El Nino event is an event in the Pacific Ocean that releases a lot of heat into the atmosphere, which then propagates throughout the tropics as a large atmospheric wave. And so basically you observe a lot of, war this is a, an image, sort of a characteristic El Nino event, your average El Nino event. You see the Pacific warms um, over, the, over several months, and then it, it produces a large atmospheric wave that basically travels eastward and engulfs, oh, great, engulfs the tropics 
um, leading to warming and drying around the world, throughout the tropics. It lasts for several months, and then it dissipates. Okay? And so what we did is we tried to identify uh, which countries around the world were getting slammed by that large atmospheric wave in sort of the random years in which this occurred. Uh, and those are the red regions in this map. And the blue regions kind of escape this event. And then we looked at whether or not the average rate of civil conflict within these countries changed conditional on the events in the Pacific Ocean that were triggering that large event. And what we found was that in the red countries, the red line here, the risk of civil conflict, of starting a new civil conflict, essentially doubles as we shift from the cool and wet La Nina state over to the hotter and dry El Nino state. Whereas, and then if we looked at those countries in the north and south that weren't getting hit by that large atmospheric wave, we see effectively no signal. Okay, this is the blue line right here. Sorry? Teleconnected, Teleconnected is just the, the name we give to these red regions. And this, that comes from this El Nino literature. They talk about this teleconnection is what causes this large atmospheric pattern. This is just an example of one of the studies. There's only one of many. Yes? No, so El Nino has sort of, it's called a quasi-periodic event. So it tends to have intervals, it has inner arrival intervals that tend to be between three and seven years. But you get events that happen two years in a row and you get events that happen a decade apart. So it's, I mean, there's a, a level of randomness in it that's very useful from an econometric standpoint. And we also call this um, abnormal rainfall pattern, right? Correct. And so did you check the relationship to the abnormal rainfall? So, so we're actually just conditioning on the state of the Pacific Ocean. We're not even trying to measure local uh, rainfall events, although in that... So what I was showing you was temperature, and temperature is a useful diagnostic for determining which locations are affected by El Nino, uh, but it is exactly correct that we think this El Nino shift leads to anomalous temperature, anomalous rainfall, as well as a variety of other types of meteorological and ecological disasters. So we're sort of using El Nino as a summary statistic to describe all of those phenomena. Okay, we're not, we're not claiming this is only temperature. Okay, so that's just one, this is just to put in context that one study. And, and over here, I'm showing you again the same data. On the top graph, the little green pixels are the locations that were getting hit by that large atmospheric wave. And on the bottom graph here is the same result, where El Nino is on the x-axis, and the, the annual, rate, annual risk of conflict is on the, the y-axis. And so we see there's a response. But what's been exciting about bringing together studies from across the literature that we then realized there were other studies that looked at subregions, looked at individual countries. There were studies that looked at subregions of, of that region, looking at individual local level violence at, at the pixel level. And there were even studies looking at the village level. So for example, here, this entire map is contained within that single pixel there. And when we look across all these different nested spatial scales, we observe sort of similar patterns, okay? So across all these different spatial scales, we see that shifts in the climate seem to be associated with different patterns of human conflict. So here we're looking at civil war. These are, are local violence, which, which tend not to be politically organized, as well as things like personal violence, so witch killing uh, in these remote Tanzanian villages. Okay, so it's been quite exciting to see, the fact, see sort of a general human response uh, to, to this sort of class of external force. Now, we see this across a variety of different contexts. Uh, so for example, uh, here we have sort of pixel level political and intergroup violence in Kenya. In Brazil, uh, there are studies of land invasions where basically peasant farmers try to, to forcefully acquire the land of their neighbors. That seem to go up when there's both extremely high rainfall or low rainfall events, both of which are bad for agriculture. As well as inter-ethnic violence in India, uh, violent personal crime in the United States, including subcategories such as rape. And then uh, on, the white, on the final axis we have sort of actual retaliation in sports. Now this is an interesting study by some psychologists. What they've done is they look at every at bat in Major League Baseball in the United States since 1950. Uh, and, they, and what happens is in baseball, uh, sometimes you get into these violent conflicts where basically the, the pitcher of one team hits the batter of the other team. And if I'm the pitcher of the guy who just got hit, I might be angry. And then I will retaliate by pegging the other batter when I'm pitching. Okay, and so we see that these types of esca this escalation occurs and conditional on temperature on the day of the match, uh, there's a much higher likelihood that this sort of personal level conflict escalates to group level conflict, okay, in this highly controlled setting. Uh, 
So the synthesis of sort of this large literature spanning many different research communities is that there is a, a sort of a quantitative association between climate variables and human conflict. We observe it across all major regions of the world, throughout human history, at all scales of human aggregation, okay, at all spatial scales, and at all temporal scales that we've been looking at. And the direction of the effect, uh, globally it appears that there's a U-shaped relationship where sort of extremely low temperatures or extremely high temperatures or extremely low rainfall or high rainfall tend to be associated with higher rates of conflict. Although in the modern world, when we look at temperature, we see almost universally that high temperatures lead to more conflict. Okay? The only way we sort of infer this U-shaped relationship is that we observe during cold epochs, historical populations have had sort of patterns of instability, instability that arise during really cold events. But that's only when sort of the world is in a very cold state. Okay? So that's, those are the general patterns, and that's what we take away from the literature. Um, I, I promised you that we would do a meta-analysis. So what we did is we sort of reanalyzed many different studies, and what we've plotted here are the, the, the strength of the association for many different studies as the dot. That's the standardized effect, and the bars describe sort of the 95 confidence interval for many different studies that are examining interpersonal violence. And there's various measures of sort of what is the average effect. You can look at sort of the mean or the inverse variance weighted mean or the median. But in general, we see that uh, the climate seems to, to uh, shift in the, one standard deviation shift in the climate tends to lead to an amplification of interpersonal violence on the scale of 2 to 4%. Um, but when we, and then when we go to intergroup conflict, there's a larger number of studies. And the overall effect size tends to be larger. So across these studies, uh, I, on the right axis, I forgot to mention, that's sort of the Bayesian estimate of the posterior distribution. So if we were to do a new study, that's, what we would, that's the distribution of results we would expect to obtain. And sort of the average effect across all these various contexts in the modern world is that sort of uh, a one standard deviation change leads to roughly a 12 to 14% amplification of intergroup conflict. Now, when interpreting these two numbers, it's important to remember that interpersonal conflict, while these, result, while these numbers are smaller, there are many, many, many more interpersonal conflicts. So in the United States alone, on an annual basis, there's two million crimes. Uh, so even a few percentage change is a large number of, of events. Uh, which, whereas for intergroup conflict, these are more rare events, but there's a higher percentage change. Okay, so just sort of to put that in context. Finally, we sort of uh, do an analysis, I'll, I can talk about it if people have questions, uh, looking for evidence of publication bias, because that's very important in any meta-analysis. You want to make sure that sort of researchers are not only publishing sort of sensational, strong findings. Uh, and so we do some formal tests, including, the, so these are the, these are the, I'll plot, this is a formal test where you sort of plot the log of the t-statistic against the statistical power of the study. And if there's absolutely no bias, you expect to get a line with a slope of one. We don't have that line, okay? So there is some evidence that not everything is perfect and, and maybe the researchers are not all behaving the way we would like them to. Uh, but nonetheless, there's clearly a, uh, a signal. If, there was, if it was just driven by publication bias, you would get sort of a flat line, okay? So there's something going on and we can't control the researchers, but in spite of bad researcher behavior, uh, we, we do have some confidence in these results. And then finally, uh, if we think about sort of what might be happening in the world in the future, this is where we've taken basically results from 20 global climate simulations, and we've rescaled them using our standard deviation measure, because that's not how they're usually reported. Uh, so this is a map of the world by 2050 in terms of the amount of warming we, would ex we expect to experience under kind of business as usual. And what we see is that through basically the entire inhabited world, uh, things warm by two to four standard deviations. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, when put set against the backdrop of these sort of recent historical results, we think that, you know, an amplification of human conflict in the future is something that we should seriously consider and think about when we're trying to imagine what the world might look like uh, if we allow the climate to change. So finally, sort of, there's a remarkably cons uh, rapid convergence of results. Uh, for an example, there's 27 modern studies that are examining the effect of temperature on conflict. And of all 27 studies, 27 of them all find a positive association. So you can think about how likely that, has occur that would have occurred by chance. If you imagine sort of flipping 27 coins and trying to get heads 27 times in a row, it's a, it's a very low likelihood event. Uh, results are slightly let weaker for rainfall. Uh, and then we're sort of concerned about these results because the quantitative magnitude of these effects is large, okay? A 14% effect 
for one standard deviation is kind of the take home number for intergroup conflict. Importantly, what we do not conclude, the climate is not the only cause of social conflict. Okay? Obviously, there are, like, human societies are extremely complex. Many, many factors uh, affect the likelihood of any given conflict occurring, as well as the, general, the overall uh, likelihood of conflict. And so we do not want to be claiming that. Uh, and also, we're sort of pointing out that despite this really strong empirical relationship between A and B, we don't know exactly what the mechanism is that links those two factors. Okay, and so we're sort of saying future research really has to pinpoint what the mechanism is that connects the climate to human conflict because from a policy standpoint, if we want to interfere or, like, uh, and break that linkage, uh, we would have to understand what the mechanism is. Okay, uh, and so that's, uh, with that, I guess we have five minutes for questions. Um, please join me So it seems like in looking at the, all these studies, uh, in most of them at least, or all of them the way you've done the empirical work, the variation is kind of off of a baseline. And uh, because of that, it's like sort of in excessively hot uh, periods, there's more conflict. Or maybe in excessively cold periods, there's less conflict. So the first thing I'd like to know is, is there any evidence for the second? Uh, point, you know, that is, is, is this sort of monotonic or is it just about it being hot? And secondly, since the, you know, there's kind of this baseline that you can't explain, um, I wonder about trying to draw conclusions about global warming, given that that's going to be kind of the standard level of heat uh, that's going to exist in the future. So, so on your first question, so the having, in, any, in most individual studies that are taking sort of a linearized approach, uh, having more conflict in hot years and less conflict in cool years are symmetric statements because it's all just relative to the mean because we have location fixed effects. Um, so, but can, can you, did you look, you can sort of separate out, you know, kind of separate out the two sides relative to the mean? So, so some studies, like I was saying, are able to recover a, like an inverted U shape, okay? So in, in locations where we have enough variation uh, for example, in the Amazon, we have years in which there's very high rainfall and very low rainfall. And that's a situation in which we can actually observe income sort of goes down in both those things, and, and, and in extreme conditions, conflict goes up in both cases. Okay? Now, when we look at temperature, we tend not to observe variations that large. And so you can think of uh, any individual study sort of being a local linearization of a globally uh, convex response function. And we see that basically when we're in hot locations or anywhere in the modern world, Higher temperatures lead to more conflict, but when we go to sort of cold epochs in Europe uh, or in China, cold events tend to lead to more conflict. So we sort of back out from that, that maybe there's some underlying relationship that's, that's convex, but we, there's no single study where we can actually observe sort of that full range of behavior. Um, your second question was thinking about the future. And so, you know, we do actually look at studies with all the different rain, uh, time scales. So some of the historical studies are looking at anomalous decades or even anomalous centuries. Those are not in the modern meta-analysis because they obviously have to go back very far in time to get repeated observations at the century scale. Um, but what they find is that there's also responses on long time scales. And so we sort of argue that uh, that suggests that even though future climate change will be gradual, uh, we shouldn't necessarily presume just because it's gradual there will be no response. Now whether or not the quantitative magnitude is identical uh, is something we need to be cautious about because we aren't doing the meta-analysis on those deep historical studies. Is that okay? Yeah. I, I like the idea of doing a panel on that, but at the same time, if this is true in panel, this should be somehow true in the cross-section, and we know some places are vastly warmer than others, and they don't seem to be vastly more violent, or are they? So, so from an inferential standpoint, we, we don't learn too much from doing the cross-section. Now the question is whether or not the cross-section is generally sort of matches these behaviors. So for example, within the United States, we actually observe that the cross-section is roughly, has the same slope uh, as the panel estimates do. But you know, we, we take that with a grain of salt because there are many things that are different between, for example, northern and southern uh, United States. 
Because I think it matters when you extrapolate to 2050, because you can think of all sorts of long-run maladjustments where societies adapt and find new ways to control violence and everything. So that's... Yeah, absolutely. But that is also one reason why we look at these long timescale responses, sort of these gradual climatic changes, because we think historically populations did have, do have very innovative ways of adapting to the climate, and despite many of those innovations, we still observe sort of certain types of violent responses. Uh, but in terms of extrapolating forward, we do want to be very cautious with that. So we are uh, extremely cautious with that. We, we were sort of are presenting this as a, something we should take seriously because of the magnitude, but of course, um, it's impossible to put down an exact number because we don't know how people will respond. And we hope that by pointing out this issue, we will sort of elicit new adaptations that, that people hadn't even been thinking about. So. So, Saul, my question is, um, you have a number of, a number of uh, control variables that are in there that you didn't talk about, and I'm wondering, was population density a control in any or many of these? And if so, w do you have a sense of what the interaction is between the climate violence relationship and population density? So, so population density is actually a control variable that some previous studies have included. When we reanalyzed it, like I said, we pulled out most of those variables. But uh, that's a famous question. It's notoriously hard to identify because we don't have good exogenous variation in the population. Uh, what we would like sort of is to drop a bunch of new people into a city and observe just how they respond. We, we can't do that. Um, but in general, most of the population trends tend to be just that, they're trends. And so their effect is going to be removed from these results because we're detrending all the data. Um, so we really can't say anything about, from a strict standpoint, like about population. Many of the studies tend to discuss both issues. Um, and I have not, I have yet to come across a study that says higher population density reduces conflict. Um, but I don't think anyone's proven it conclusively one way or the other. Uh, I guess there's... I'm just curious. Oh, sorry. Wrong way around. <laughs> so I'm curious, and you're probably going to write these papers. Um, like, what hope or what sort of feasible angles do you see for um, figuring out what the mechanisms are that determine whether temperature shocks are having effects on conflict or not in some countries versus other? Like, an interesting one would be, for example, people have hypothesized Botswana maintained peace because they had very good drought insurance provided by the government, for example. And so, like, the degree to which the state institutions provide protection from risk might mediate this response to a great extent. I mean, so what hopes are there of, like, really nailing down what the mechanisms are? So um, that's a great question. Uh, there are certain things we can take away observationally. Like, for example, we do not think that exposure for a few hours making you more violent in horn honking is caused by the economy contracting. So, so we sort of know that we can rule that pathway out in that specific context. But in each context, it's quite likely that there are probably multiple pathways involved. Um, we sort of write in the paper, and, and I th think it's true, the, uh, probably the most useful way forward is to look for situations where we have kind of some natural event, some natural experiment where one of the pathways is broken exogenously, like you're saying. So if the government of Botswana just sort of one day randomly gave uh, rainfall insurance to half the population, then what would be great to do is to be collecting data during that interval and observe whether or not the linkage between temperature and conflict in locations that received insurance and those that did not uh, look different. So there's actually one study uh, by Heather Sarsons at, at Harvard who, where she sort of looks in different regions of India and says, well, we thought it was income, we thought it was agricultural income, but some locations have dams and some don't. And in the locations where there are dams, uh, agricultural income appears to be decoupled from rainfall, basically because populations can then irrigate. But in those populations, we still observe a correlation between rainfall and, and inter-ethnic violence, so it must not be the income channel. Now, uh, we think that's like a very interesting result. It's not conclusive because there's sort of trade in these local markets, and so like, people's real income might actually still continue to vary if food prices are changing. Uh, but we think that's the approach that people need to take in terms of ruling out specific pathways in specific contexts.
I, I just wonder about the publication bias question. When you read these, these 17 studies, I would expect that you'd find the effects to go down in all 17 if there was publication bias. The effects to go down. Yeah, the temperature effects. Oh, so, so we do. So so, but we, you find both. It seems, it yeah, seems surprising. So that's one reason. We, we actually say this in the paper. We say we don't think publication bias is completely driving our results for a variety of reasons. And one is that we think that one component of publication bias we're worried about is people kind of tweaking their regressions a little bit to make their results look as strong as possible. But sort of by declaring one approach and then just running all the models that way, we're kind of undoing all those little tweaks that people might be doing. So there are a couple papers that were just barely statistically significant as published, and we reanalyzed them, and now they're just barely not, you know? And so we sort of think we're undoing all of those, those problems. Um, and so I agree with you. I mean, I don't think our results are completely driven by publication bias, and I think some of the things we've done, like the reanalysis, um, help to counteract any sort of bad behavior among researchers. Am I, I don't look like I'm addressing that question. Well, there's also a selection issue, right? You've only got these 60 studies. There were a bunch of other people who did studies and found no evidence, but they never, their studies never even made it to your 60. Exactly. So that, that's, 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 a, that's different a different form kind of publication of bias. bias. This is, so just for people who aren't familiar, it's, this is called like the file drawer problem, which is like I do a study, I don't get anything interesting, so I put it in my file drawer and, and no one ever sees it. Now we're worried about that because we can't, we can't really do anything about that. The, the test I showed you, um, is a classic test for this. So, it, uh, but we also think that there's, uh, so I'll tell you one thing. So that's actually, a, because this paper has been, um, this paper's come out already. We've already gotten like lo lots of feedback on it, both in the popular <laughs> press and, uh, and, and in like emails. And so this was like a very uh, interesting article in basically the, the most widely read German newspaper. Um, and there's a very famous German social scientist, Jürgen Schäferin, who's quoted in the beginning, uh, as well as someone who, who, who's uh, predictably unhappy with the response, Halvard Buhag in Norway. And they both are saying, you know, these guys have major bias issues. There's like lots of publication bias, lots of things that are not being accounted for. Um, and, and by omitting them, they get these bias results. So, you know, one of our reactions was this, where we said, okay, let's think about, suppose our result is just driven by publication bias. How biased must we or the research community have been in order to obtain these results? Suppose there's actually no relationship, and uh, suppose that's the right result. So what we do to, to sort of go through that thought experiment is we redo the analysis, but imagine that we keep getting these zero results. Basically, we're taking uh, one of those guys' studies that claims to find zero effect, and we imagine that there's like hundred or many, many other people obtaining that same result, and we add them in over and over, and we keep computing what our results would have been, and so, like sort of with none of those other replicant studies, uh, that's our main result, and we find that in order for our result to be driven only by bias, there must be 80 other research papers out there that were put in file drawers and never made it, never saw the light of day, right? Or that we ignored intentionally because we're biased researchers. Um, and so just to recall, sort of that result was, driven, was obtained with 21 studies, which means that basically 80% uh, of the literature had to have been like ignored. Uh, and we, we just think that's implausible. So, so sort of this is one sort of back of the envelope check on whether or not that's like a fatal flaw or not. Now you could argue maybe the real effect's a little lower. I would be definitely receptive of, of that critique. between all these studies by standard deviation, sort of a first moment scaling. I'm just wondering, what do we know climate-wise about other moment? Sort of are more extreme events, you know, more like you, or is that trend in the frequency of more extreme events that wouldn't show up necessarily by scaling by standard deviation in the same way? Is that, I, I can imagine two things. One, it's different between the, the time period of study in some sense. Um, and I know you're controlling for time, frequency. I, some of these details about the actual measurement of climate seem to get lost here. Yes. And I'm wondering whether the scaling you do would interact with the time dimension compound or, or create other issues potentially. So um, that's a great point. And we also, the less interesting avenue for future research that we point out in the paper is we need to work on how people are selecting their climate measure of interest. 
So we can't control that, and we kind of can only replicate studies based on what they produce. But some researchers choose to look at rainfall. Some choose to look at temperature. Some choose to look at the Palmer Drought Severity Index or the Thermal Comfort Index. Um, and in not all cases can we actually go back and get the raw data and do it the way we think it should be done with sort of all the variables separately laid out. So, so we sort of say that's a really important avenue for future research, trying to figure out is it these extreme events, is it rainfall, is it temperature, is it the combination of the two? We don't know. Um, all we can sort of say is that this, there's a collection of climate variables and across a variety of contexts. They seem to be having a measurable effect, but pinning down exactly which variable it is is going to be part of the exercise of pinning down the mechanism, right? Because if it's temperature versus rainfall, that also affects how we think about what it could be, what, what, it, what could be the pathway. Um, I'm not sure I understand sort of how it's interacting with the, the time variation, but clearly one reason we do it is because when you look at different time scales, you get different levels of variance. Uh, and so the study, right, yeah. And so uh, what's really important, what we found kind of shocking actually was that people had reported all these different results and once we rescaled them, they, they seemed to be in this pretty narrow window. Uh, so the level of variability that was observed in sort of that meta-analysis, we were, we were um, given what people had been saying prior to us doing this, that like nobody's getting the same results, that, that results are different across the board, the fact that basically 95% of the estimates are between 10 and 40% uh, percent we thought was sort of surprisingly consistent. Um, people, it sounded like people were talking about getting things that were like 600% of someone else's result, you know, and that, that doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, I think um, we should wrap up. Our time is almost over, so thank you once again. And, uh...